Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to City University. I am Angela Beer, and we'll hear a little bit more about me later on. But uh, this is the Sanford Institute's weekly or monthly weekly guys, monthly uh, workshop, which they were going to talk a little bit about stewardship, so much stewardship. Um, just a little bit more about Sanford. We are in the business of the delightful to me business of offering fundraising training to the nonprofit community. That is our mission, to support the impact of nonprofits by increasing their fundraising capabilities with free and low cost trainings. Um, so there's a very, I consider enlightened gentleman in uh, San Diego, close to our national university affiliate, who very, <laughs> I think he had a great, what's the word, foresight, um, to see that the nonprofit sector needs support. He funded all these institutes, and there are about 18 to 20 of us around the United States, uh, most housed at academic institutions, but some on their own or as part of another nonprofit. Um, we are the Seattle affiliate, and you can see our mission. And we base our curriculum on the cycle that Mr. Sanford created, the donor relationship cycle, which a lot of you are probably also familiar with, so everything I present is somehow associated with that cycle. Oh, a few housekeeping. Um, slides and recording uh, link are always sent out after the program, so you know, you're know welcome to take notes, but don't think that you'll never see this again, because you will. Um, and this is a little bit more about me. I, like you all, I go into your fundraisers. Sometimes we get some program folks or people who just want more. Um, like all of you, I was in fundraising for 30 years. I um, well, started as a grant writer and moved on to be a director of development and even an executive director, mostly in the arts. But in the last uh, seven to eight years, I've gone more towards human services. Um, now I went to school because I wanted to be an executive director. <laughs> Funny how that works, right? And uh, I wanted to learn all of the marketing and the finance, et cetera, but it, I came back to fundraising, and who knew? Because I never set out to be a fundraiser. They didn't have this kind of thing when I was younger. Um, you just fell into it because for many reasons, which is what I did. Um, but I came back to it because, like you all know, there's nothing better than getting that check in the mail or that credit card payment online and saying, hey, because I did this, 10 people are going to have a place to sleep tonight or, you know, 50 kids are going to get fed today, or this wonderful art performance is going to be presented, and, you know, the uplift people and inspire them, et cetera. So here I am, still in fundraising, 35 years later. Um, got a couple of degrees along the way, and you can see all my creds up there if you're interested. Um, but the more important thing is today we are talking about stewardship. And what I want you to take away is why stewardship is important, objectives of a good stewardship program, and strategies to add to your own current plan. If you have one, if you don't, that's okay. Now, up front, I'm going to say I know, I know, and maybe things are changing, that stewardship, when I was a frontline fundraiser, is somewhat, it could be neglected because why? No time. No money, not enough people, and the emphasis is on get the check, get the money, right? Is that still what y'all experience? Tell me about it. We're going to be more interactive today than maybe perhaps we are usually. Are you guys still? Come on, don't be shy. You are being recorded, but don't be shy. <laughs> How many of y'all have full on stewardship plans in place right now? No is okay. How many of you, does anyone here have a full-time or even part-time staff person devoted to stewardship? Part of your time, part of any? Yeah? That's really great. Okay, awesome. Um, all right, so is there anyone in the room that needs convincing of how important stewardship is? Don't be shy. You're also, you're pretty much looking for ways to do it with a full plate and no help and no money. <laughs> right? Yes. Okay. I'm not sure that's entirely possible, but let's see uh, what I can help you with today for that. Um, so let's talk about context. And I give you a lot of this because you have people that you have to answer to. 
and you have people that may need some persuading on why this is an important use of time and resources, either yours or somebody else's, right? So take this away and give it to your boss, do what you have to do. Um, the ads for this program told you that Giving USA, which is a report that's published once a year on the previous year's philanthropy in the United States, told us that for the first time ever, overall giving went up, but there was a significant decrease in individual gifts at the mid and small level, both in terms of the retention and the straight out number of donors. Okay? So, first decline went five years. And the first time individual giving was less than 70% of total giving since 1954, which is, if you've been in fundraising since jobs a boy like me, is huge. Really, it's a big, it's kind of a big deal. Um, one of the reasons for that, acquisition of new donors is down and retention rates are down. So we're getting fewer new donors and we're not doing the royal we, no fingers being pointed, we are not doing as good of a job of keeping our donors as we have in the past. Okay, well, what does that tell you? What does that say to you? Come on, somebody shout it out. Help me out. What do we need to be doing? <laughs> right, we need to, do we want to focus on acquiring new donors? Maybe, but retention, is our bread and butter. Why is that? We know that if we retain and steward our existing donors, we'll bring them to our site. Yes, or, that's true. New donors, donors and current donor, current donors make referrals. Current donors talk to their neighbor and say, I know you care as much as I do about hungry kids. Want to come to this event next week? I want you, I think you should know more about this nonprofit that I'm involved Right? Here's some more factoids for those who need to sell this to your powers that be, right? For those who erroneously believe that new donors are going to come in with a $10,000 gift, they're dead wrong. On the average, it takes five years for a new donor to make a major gift. Okay? If you can't keep them for five years, you're never going to see that money. Acquisition costs are 50 to 100% more than the dollars raised from a new donor. So it costs you $2 to raise a dollar with new donors. Is that it? Do we want, how long, if, how, is that sustainable? No, it's not. Okay, it's a net loss. New donors are a net loss. We need what's called lifetime value to recoup the cost that we had of getting the donor in the first place, okay? Only 29 to 45%, less than half, and I read several articles and they all varied on this, of first time donors make a second gift. So again, we wanna be keeping those folks and having them come back so we don't have to spend the $2 to get a dollar next year. Right. Again, I, you guys are all, I know you're the choir, but the, the people leadership in your organizations, if you're not leadership, are often doing to this club. It's just, it's just being nice to people, and we're all nice people anyhow, so forget about it. Go raise some more money. Anybody hear that? Everything stays in this room, <laughs> except for the recording, of course. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I. Well, that battle, when I was fundraising, I would present it, uh, the, what's the first thing to go when budget cuts come? Right? Why are you having so many parties yeah. with people? You don't want to do that kind of thing. They just want to give us money. Well, we'll cut that expense out. Right? Yeah. I'm happy to have I was also to say Thank you. 
insurers are actually having a higher rate of losing their existing supporters because of how that's how they see that funding in their So online folks, can you hear all right? The uh, comment was that attrition is raised is rising because loyal donors are feeling like they're being overlooked, ignored, not treated well, or treated like ATM machines in favor of new donors. So I think we all agree that stewardship is the thing, right? It's the it's the what we want to do to keep our donors and keep them happy and save our costs and you know and really engage people in those long-term relationships that we all pay lip service to. And I know and I'm not I'm saying that with you, not at you. Okay. So our goals of stewardship are strengthen the relationship with the donor. I put that first. Why? What do you think? As fundraisers, is our most is our most important goal to save money? Yeah, I can stand up here. I can talk about how much more expensive it is to acquire a new donor than to keep an old one happy, old, excuse me, current one happy. But is that really why we're in this business to save the expense of betraying, uh, acquiring new donors? Be brave, people. Is that why you're in fundraising? No. I think uh, most of us are in fundraising because we feel it's important. What we feel about our own mission, we're very passionate about, and we want to share that with other people by building those relationships with them, right? Yeah, it would be nice to do so in a way that was efficient and you know, save some costs, but we want people to engage with the organization, and stewardship is the number one way to get them to do that. Anyone disagree? Awesome. We want to increase our donor retention for some of the reasons that we've already mentioned, right? And eventually, well cared for donors will increase their giving. Might take time, but that's the surefire way to do it, okay? So, others, other reasons that stewardship's important? Do I miss anything? I know that we have a wide range of, of sectors here, and experience, and NGOs that are international, and bikes, and schools, and who knows what. So, and everyone does stuff differently. So, don't be shy. Your experience is just as valuable as what I'm talking about. So, please educate me as well. Okay. So, let's talk about how we're going to do this stewardship thing. Jump in anytime if we if you're not doing this already. You know, if you are and you have ideas or stuff to add to the conversation, please do. Okay. So first, we're going to want to identify and segment our donors. And I should, to begin with, I'm sorry, I should have been clear. This is about we're talking now about mid-level and lower-level donors. Okay. I hope and think that most of you probably have major gift thing pretty well in hand. Um, but if not, all of this applies to them as well. Okay. I see no, no smirking. <laughs> <laughs> um, this will help you with your major gifts as well, should that not be the case. Okay? So, we want to identify and segment our donors. And when I say segment, what does that mean? I know it's, people hear that and they think, you know, geometry, mm -hmm. line segment, right? But what are we doing? We're grouping our donors, right? We're putting them into groups based on certain characteristics. Right now, we're talking about giving levels, but we'll see later on there's other ways to do it. So. What constitutes major, mid-level, and lower-level gifts? Anyone have criteria in their organization now? Okay, so you do? Uh, we call it major gift thousand dollars. Thousand dollars is a major gift at the bike not the cast stage by the bike works. Okay, so thousand dollars. How did you know how that was determined? And that was okay. Uh, that decision is predates my tenure. So it's a legacy decision. Yeah. I don't know if we we also have you know our top 100 list you know, mm -hmm. CRM and we pay attention to it. Mm -hmm. They probably all give one hundred dollars. Okay. So there are a couple ways of doing this. I I do it one way, and the readings I did suggested another. So take me, do what works for you. Remember the 80-20 rule, or now it's the 90-10 rule in fundraising, right? What is that? The top 20% of your donors are going to constitute 80% of your revenue. 
And that's how I do my major gift. What's the word? Line. I look at the donor pyramid and I say, okay, uh, 80, everybody above that's a major donor. What level is that hovering around? That's what makes sense to call a major gift for me. Now, another way to do it, and this is what I put on the PowerPoint here, is to take a look at your top five or ten gifts. And if there's anything that's an outlier, the example I read was you have six gifts, five of them are between $750 and $1,250, and then one is $25,000. Take out the outlier, because it doesn't make sense to try to put that in your calculations, right? So if you have five gifts, your top five gifts are $750 to $1,250, what would you think the major gift level would be that would be appropriate for your organization? About $1,000, right? So there you have it. You know that $1,000 is where your major gift club, whatever you want to call it, your major gift segment lies. Then you're going to look at your average gift for your organization. So your organization's top gift is $1,250. It's like you've got 100 donors and you raise $100,000 a year. Am I doing the math right? $100, 100000 a year, average gift is $1,000. Mm -hmm. I am doing the math wrong. Okay, you got 1000 dollars <laughs> and you raise $100,000 a year. Your average gift is 100 bucks, right? So that's your lower level donors. 100 or so and below are your annual fund, your lower, whatever you're going to end up, however you're going to refer to that segment. Those are the folks that are on the bottom of the pyramid. What's everything else in between? So 100 to 999 are your mid-level donors. Okay? Everybody with me? I see yeah. When you talk about these levels and the calculations, would you refer to like the most recent fiscal year? Or would you also look at yes. historical? Well, it would depend on, right now I'm talking about segmenting for gift size. We're not talking about longevity and all that. But you'll see, are there other ways to segment your donors if you want to think about how you're going to steward them? So we, these are uh, major, mid, and lower is according to giving. But let's talk about if we wanted to steward our new donors in a different way than we did during their first year as opposed to our current donors or our really loyal donors, all the 10-year donors, if we wanted to somehow a stewardship program for them or you know it, it, there are lots of ways to skin a cat right so think about who you want to focus on well what are our goals right who do we want to hold on to who do we want to increase their giving what else what's our third goal who do we want to continue to build relationships with what group and if that's the mid-level donors there's your plan if that's your loyal donors there's your plan Right? So think of what are your goals? What groups do you want to apply those three goals to? Keeping, building a relationship, increasing it. We have a question online. We do. Um, somebody asks, when calculating your like brackets, um, do you include auction items slash proceeds as a gift? No. Because that is, auction items always have a value given. And so, say you paid thousand dollars for an auction item, but it was worth five hundred. Well, your actual gift to the organization. No, <laughs> I won't spend take up a lot of time explaining why. But if this is we're talking cash, or stocks, or whatever is strictly strictly benefits the organization without returning anything. Okay, is that helpful, everybody? Oh. All right. So, let's. You brought it up, so I'm going to pick on you. Talk about how you would want to steward your, sounds like most loyal donors. Why? Tell us why. Why would we want to? Well, not why would you want to. I'm sorry. What would you think about in making that choice that would make you decide to focus your stewardship efforts on your loyal donors as opposed to, say, your lower level donors, your current lower level donors? Yeah. All of them. We would also put it into the context of the work that are right, and there are no right or wrong answers. I'm just yeah, yeah. So like you know, for me, when I think about our, so we serve girls in uh, grades third through eighth grade, 
girls through to eighth grade. So, so many people. of them are, many of the donors are parents or coaches of those girls, and they're going to perhaps like age out at mm -hmm. some point. And so I might pay a little bit more attention to like those parents of third graders who might be with the program for a long time. Okay, so, so you wrong. no, not at all. That that you're you're proving my point that it's contextual, right? For this organization, holding on to loyal donors, because right now I'm assuming you don't have bandwidth to do every possible segment, is the most is the primary focus, and that's perfectly okay and makes sense, right? Whatever your organization's needs are, what you need to obviously kind of think through our retention. Perhaps you have a great retention rate. You know, you have a fantastic 75 to 80 percent of your donors. What does that tell you? They're saying you're already doing a good job with your current donors, right? So who could you do better with? Or who could you encourage to give more if you focused on that group? Is this helping? So it's not, you know, I, I can provide different tools, but in your own context, you have to go back and say, okay, what makes sense for our organization, right? So, do we feel like we can identify and segment our donors in a way that makes sense? Yes, no, more information questions? Okay, then let's move on. Once we have that done, we're going to set stewardship, what I'm calling our guidelines, okay? I started with policy because that's talked about a lot in the literature, but we're going to call it guidelines. Why? Because there's never a policy that doesn't have exceptions. So what the guidelines essentially tell you is who is stewarding, what donors, when, and how do we record what we did. Okay? And this is where you sit down and literally say, all right, so... For my donors of 25 years or more, our board president is going to call them. For our donors of 10 years and more, our CEO is going to call them. Five years and more, our development director is going to call them. It's, that's where I'm going with this, right? Every new gift that comes in up to 500, I call them. I'm the development director. Over 500, my executive director calls them. Over 1,000, the board president writes them a handwritten note. Over 20,000. Woohoo, right? The board president takes them to dinner. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? It's it's how you're going to thank your donors and steward them. And you need to get it in writing because, as our uh, Bike Works friend pointed out, sometimes nobody knows where it came from or it's, it's always been done this way or whatever. Put it down in writing and it's a living, breathing thing because things are changing, right? Um, and you need to figure out how we're going to respond to each one of the donor segments that you've identified as being important. Okay? Gift thank you and gift acknowledgments. Who knows there's a difference? I'm going to be totally honest. I didn't until yesterday. Because every, I know, you're like, what the hell? All of, <laughs> I've been fundraising for 8 million years, and we've always put the receipt information within a thank you letter. So I was like, okay, I guess, you know, you can do one without the other or neither at all. Um, which I also see happen. There's going to be a lot of my personal stories mixed <laughs> into this little thing, right? Um, so, gift thank you. What's that? Right up on the board. Thank you is what? Thank you for your gift. We got it. We're going to use it for this. It's going to help build a hospital, it's going to help feed kids, it's going to help people ride their bikes to work. It's plain and simple. In my school of thinking, everyone who gives you anything gets a thank you. I've actually had this argument with staff, you know, well, they, they, they dropped off some in-kind that we're never going to be able to use. I don't care. They're getting a thank you. Are they getting an acknowledgement? For their IRS and for their taxes? No. In my example. Because in kind, you have to value a certain way, it has to be something, right? It wouldn't be something that the organization could give them credit for. I'm muddying the waters. We'll move on. Um, 
Now, who is required to get an acknowledgement? Who is required to get a gift acknowledgement? All donors of $250 or more. Now, since we're all good fundraisers, we probably and hopefully send out acknowledgements with the tax information and the amount, the date of the gift, to everyone. But if you're in a pinch, you must send them to give donors of 250 and above. Right? Everybody with me? All right. So when we consider our stewardship, we say thank you first. And guys, ladies, whatever, I know that you probably like, this is such a dumb moment. So doesn't everybody do that? And the answer is no. I walked into an ED position once where none of the donors had been thanked for three years. Their gifts had been received and recorded, and that was it. It was, it was, I was just flabbergasted, right? So, as, as obvious as it seems, online people, everyone, you must thank and acknowledge your donors. And there are really some clever ways of doing this, especially with technology these days. And I would want to hear some of your ideas before I share. My example, how do you thank your donors? Do you thank your donors? Be honest. Everybody thanks their donors here? So, okay. so one thing that happens with us is if a person makes a donation online, they'll receive an email acknowledgement of their gift, mm -hmm. and then it's followed up by another letter that uh, states Thank you so much for your gift. Online donation gets email and a snail mail letter thanking them for their gift. And then the handwritten note. Handwritten note. But but I think that I don't know if you all subscribe to who um, nonprofit AF um, was discussing the fact that that's a handwritten note is basically kind of a white sort of way in which we function. So how do we become I had that thought when I was preparing this, this uh, because handwritten notes are everywhere, all over the literature, and we have a question online, and I read that, and I was like, are handwritten notes really dying? I still love getting them. I'm a middle-aged white woman. Woman. Um, hold the thought, and we're coming back to it. Online question. Oh, it was just another contribution to the conversation. Okay, let's hear it. Um, somebody mentions that in addition to a letter or call, etc., donors over a certain amount, like $100 or 150 for the previous calendar year, are invited to a donor appreciation event. Donor appreciation events from gifts from the last year before they give again, or? Um, it was written to imply, like, from the previous year, like from the you previous gave a certain year. amount, okay. you get invited to the event. So okay, great. Back to the handwritten notes. Young people, I'm going to count on you a lot for this because you're more tuned in to what's going on in, in you know, with equity and issues. I love handwritten notes and I still think they're important. I would hope that one wouldn't offend somebody. Let's hear what you all think. I would never be offended by it. I love it. I'm Michael. I still think it's still pretty good. Can I just add to Louise's conversation? Yeah, please. Part of the Part of it was about power dynamics and it was institutionalized. Some of it was in regards to like job interviews and how to know yeah. what to send mm -hmm. thank yous to the person interviewing you, they know you should be interviewing. I mean, there are all kinds of other social dynamics. Power dynamics and social dynamics yeah. involved in the in, conversation of thank I'm, I'm repeating for the online yeah. folks in case you can't hear. In, but no, it, it picks up pretty well as long as people okay. reject anyone in the room. Okay, great. Will be heard. Yeah. Um, Just to unpack that a little bit. Part of that conversation was about the equity dynamics. Okay, so that's something that's something we need to be aware of. Then, um, in your constituencies, if that's felt to be uh, offensive is maybe too strong, but felt to be in it. What am I trying to say? Here? Inappropriate. inappropriate or putting the power dynamic into play. Uh, you need to be aware of that. You need to know your folks. I think um, one point from that article yeah. was also that. Not, not that uh, the handwritten note is necessarily like he was saying he loves the handwritten note. It's like generally a good thing, but then maybe not to if you're the donor or you're the interviewer. You 
know, you don't receive that handwritten note to maybe not penalize, like, well, they didn't do it right, they don't know how to fundraise, they don't know how to engage, yeah. they missed the handwritten note, that's clearly the gold standard, like, yeah. they're, you know, a bunch of amateurs. So um, the other point was that, like, it was, there's other ways to do it, not that the handwritten note is bad, ever. Mm -hmm. like, that's the point. Of, like, okay. The note is going to be offensive. It's that, like, maybe there's other ways to do it. So, other ways and it to could be related to capacity. Really? Well, capacity? So. Okay. So you're saying it's more about the absence of anger than the notes. I think like, if I remember the article, that was more what you're saying. That you're All not I'm seeing handwritten notes, that's not necessarily a sign of disrespect or yeah. amateur fundraising or laziness. Or or laziness. Yeah. yeah, it could just be um, not the preferred method of communication or uh, maybe the organization doesn't have the capacity to write this out and would think that it would be so as important as sort of like the fundraising will be standard at a certain level of personal touch. Yeah, very, and I'm glad you brought it up. Um, I wish I had all the answers, I don't, but that's why I bring the brain trust together because we're all going to figure it out together, right? And when it comes to thinking, I have found a fabulous, I love this example. Um, well, I guess my example is next. Excuse me, we all thank our donors promptly, right? In whatever vehicle we're going to use, prompt thank yous. And this should be in your stewardship policy. You know, thank you of whatever type is out minus 24 hours. Um, and I'm part of really, you know, and I've usually got the capacity to be able to make that happen. Um, prompt is important. Make it as personal as possible. And I read a wonderful uh, paragraph on how you could do that with very little time. And the, it ended up saying that any personal touch, any even a thank you with your name at the bottom, handwritten, is better than the form letter to dear friend. Um, on social media, which so many people are, what? Oh, thank you videos. Social media, thank you videos. Yes, we'll get to that. Um, you can do video. You can. Uh, what did I see? It was a wonderful video that I, I couldn't didn't have the time to play, but it was uh, in a higher education setting where a video was made by one of the current donors, addressed to the future students, and saying, "I made this gift because in eight years, when you're at this school." I want you to have X, Y, and Z. It was fabulous. Um, also, if you, when you do your donation forms or however you communicate with your donors, when you get their information, if it's appropriate to ask for the social media handle, you can thank them online very quickly. And that's a fabulous example I came up with. Isn't this the coolest thing? You can see it. It's a, another alumni thank you with the mascot, right? It's a little eagle loved in the cool sweater saying, Thank you, Alyssa. Because they've gotten donors handle and she replies here, you know, you're so welcome and that's so cute and she was thrilled, right? Now, they're refusing to pay attention to, of course, privacy, right? Confidentiality. Not everybody's gonna dig this. Um, if you who participated in Give Big? Did you and so you saw in the form that donors could use that they had a checkbox option as to whether or not you could publish their gift on social media or publish it anonymously. Include that in your, your uh, gift materials or your stewardship materials. And if they say, okay, you know, I'm sure that these folks had this pre-made and just drop names in, right? Bam, out it goes online. Okay, I love this example. I, I, I like to stay young, right? So coming back to planning, because thank you is universal. Everybody has to thank all our donors. But in planning, we want to create a plan for each of our donor segments, whatever we determine that to be. Okay? And we want to plot out and budget for cost money to raise money. I'm never going to stop saying it, even though I know what the realities you're facing. For your communication for thank you events across the year for each segment. Okay? Designate staff or staff time. To each donor segment, who's the primary contact for that segment. So I'm going back to major, mid, and lower level donors for convenience, but whatever. So you've got a major gift officer, and if you have even one person doing both mid and lower level donors, that person is responsible for the stewardship of those donors. 
You're looking at me like, are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> I know. I, I, I know. I know. But it's my job to, to, to continue to encourage you to take these steps. I, I know. And there's no judgment or criticism involved if you're just overwhelmed. Okay. Um, somebody does have to deal with those donors. So let's talk about what it looks like if you don't have that staff. I'm going to pick on you a little bit. Um, and Jen, I you're looking, well, you both kind of look at me like I'm going for your head, second head. So uh, you have no time to do this, it looks like. Uh, I am the same person that mm -hmm. will be doing this. Okay. So, yes. Uh, how do I segment out all of these folks and how much time do I assign to each, along with all the other daily operational things that I need to do? Okay. Well, I'm going to, well, the segmenting probably, are you it? Are you like a one person uh, shop? Or? No. Uh, no. Okay. Let's say two. Okay, you got two. <laughs> yeah. Um, the segmenting obviously is somebody who has to, you have to have somebody who knows your donor database yeah. or Excel or whatever it is you use, right? Is there anyone else who can help with that? Or is it you? It's me. Okay, so segmenting, we can't escape. How's your board with fundraising? They could probably use some encouragement. All right. <laughs> and the reason I bring this up is because stewardship is a fantastic way to keep your board fundraising and helping you with it. Right? So maybe you can't assign your, because you're, you're more busy, they have lives and jobs, right? So maybe you can't assign them a segment, but if you could create the plan and ask them to implement it, it's taking how much of the work off your plate? A third to two thirds? Yeah. That gives it a certain level of will uh, rotate board member thank you calls. So each board member only has to do a thank you call. like. Every few months, you know, because we have 15 or so board members, and it's only you know, at a certain level, but it's like a really nice and a opportunity for the board members as well. So I feel like we're really doing something specific for us instead of just like the other community. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I had something like that in place too before the gala consumed everything, where every month for the board meeting I was showing up, um, and I, I already had it pre planned. Assign, I think I assigned two note cards and a phone call to each board member every month. So every month, each board member only had to write out two thank you cards, mail it, you know, I already had it stamped and addressed for them, and make one phone call. And it seemed manageable. They, I think they're happy to just do anything else, mm -hmm. but it, it really kind of, I mean, it means that not everyone is thanked all at once, but those thank yous were kind of staggered for the year. And I also, I, I kind of like that I hate too, because it meant that the thank yous, I mean, they got all the personal thank yous from my office for me, but the additional personalized thank you didn't seem necessarily connected with any particular gift. It was just thank you for, thank you for being their supporter, being their boy, you know, that type of thing. So it was And, and it more than that encouragement that once they've accepted these tasks, you could say to them, you are fundraising. You are doing the important work of fundraising, which all of them think is solicitation, right? I call it friend raising, like that. You can call it whatever makes sense, but uh, they are friend raising. <laughs> they are participating in the fundraising cycle for the organization. And something else to remember is, yes, segmenting probably all seems overwhelming right now, but you'll only have to do it once, at least for the foreseeable future. You'll say, okay, yeah, we are going to steward our Major, mid, and lower level donors, figure out who those are, you're set. Anytime a gift comes in at one of those levels, you got a plan in place and you know where they belong. Is that helpful to help you think about it? Sure. I, I know it's a it's it's more work. There's no getting around it. Um, but it's gonna pay off. It really will. Um, okay. Uh, another idea that I saw on online was that if that once we designate a person, I'm sorry, I feel terrible that I'm putting dumping this all on you, but uh, I know you're so brought in, so bear with me. Um, that person should put their business card in every communication with the donors, so that they feel that group feels like they they have someone on the inside that they can go to, right? 
just like the major colors do. Anybody agree, disagree? I see some folded arms. Are you sleeping? <laughs> Are you overwhelmed? <laughs> I'm just taking everything you're saying yeah. and applying it to my unique situation. There are a lot of unique, yeah. Well, and I teach in the middle of the road, but everybody, you know, so we do, let's, we can adapt. We'll talk about, I mean, how we can adapt. I mean, you've got some good ideas, I hope, already, so carrying on. All right, so that's, we've set up our stewardship activities, right? We've got a plan, we know who they are, who the donors are that we want to steward, and we've got a point person or two or three or a half um, dedicated to those folks. More ideas, and this is, now here we're getting down to the nuts and bolts of it all. Branding, and everybody's like, Twitch, 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 we can't afford a designer, we can't, you know, da da da. Brand your mid level and lower level donors and decide the benefits you're going to experience. This is big in the arts. I, I frankly was stunned when I went to the social services and saw they don't have their golden angel circle. You know what I'm saying? But, it, you know, it, it, it's helpful to stewardship activities for you and for them to know exactly the, the benefits they're going to receive as a donor. Create a group identity that can be included on all their materials. And I like again, when it comes down to cost, it can be something like a simple logo. That you everybody anybody know about Canva? You do Canva? So Canva is a website that has a kind of a what do they call it? They call it a freemium. There's a free level and then you can pay just like every other LinkedIn and all that. And you can create Amazing things for free and pretty efficiently, right? It doesn't take days and days and days. You want to call your your top donors the golden angels? Get some wings, color them yellow, and plop a GA in there in the font that you like, right? Am I being over? Am I over uh, <laughs> overselling? Yes. Um, and then that goes on all the golden angels' communications. They know that they're a golden angel. They know who to talk to about the Golden Angels, right? And they get news over the years that says, you Golden Angels have raised 50% of our budget this year, and that's made it possible for us to do X, Y, and Z. Right? It's not a snobby type thing. It's more of a, it's an affiliation. It's an affinity thing. People feel like they belong and are part of something. Am I making sense? Okay. I know I do come from an arts background that some people think of this elitist, but uh, there's there's a method to the madness. There's you saying behind. I have to admit that in the arts, there's more obvious mission aligned mm -hmm. donor benefits. It's true. It's true. It's true. It's true. It's true. And and that's not that right. It's impossible, but it's like pretty obvious. So you do have to put on your thinking caps. Um, here's an example of an arts related organization that has what's called a donor matrix. And that's all the benefits that accrue to the donors, and I love their branding. 149 is a squire. This is the Kentucky Shakespeare donor segment. Branding and benefits. A squire, a knight, Shakespeare, right? An earl, a duchess, Stratford Society. Anyhow, it goes on and on. They're all branded. And anything from an online name listing all the way to sponsoring a character or a director in one of their plays. Okay, yes, the arts do lend themselves to stuff like that. This example shows you how you can organize, and it helps you also track, you know, who's getting what. You can incorporate this in your, into your planning and say, okay, yeah, we have to list all our donors online on January 1, because that's when our website refreshes. You know, right? On when we publish our annual report, we have to make sure we get blah, blah, X, Y, and Z in there. So it does help with your planning too. But I gotta tell you, um, there are sophisticated low cost benefits you can frankly steal from your major gift program, okay? And technology is fantastic with this. this we were talking about it earlier. Virtual town halls or conference calls with staff, okay? So say you've decided that you want to segment into a group all of your education donors. About education programs, you want to you want to your organization wants to grow them, so you know you're going to be asking these donors to give more in the near future. 
and you decide you want to steward them appropriately. And so you might have a town hall with your education director, not an ask, just saying, our education director wants to kind of let you know what our plans are. Put it out there online through your various free channels like MailChimp, which isn't really free anymore. <laughs> Austin, I can tell you those stories if you don't have your own. Um, invite them to a town hall and have your education director talk to your current donors. And it's a town hall, right? So your current donors say, hey, I know you like education. Neighbor, you want to come and have a cocktail with me while we watch this town hall? Because I think you'd be really excited about what Group Sex Life is doing in their education department. Webinars. Digital recognition, again, the whole Golden Angels thing being put in everywhere. Days of learning, we talked about a little bit before we started officially. So, say you work for a social justice organization that's dealing with immigration, there's a lot out there, right? A lot of fodder. And you know, you could have a day of learning about ICE, and you could have a day of learning about what constitutes legal entry into the U.S. versus illegal. Is there any such a thing as illegal? It's a misdemeanor, right? I won't go there. Um, anywho, things that people really care about now and are inspiring them to give and support your nonprofit, educate your donors about it, right? I felt I came across a book club that I was sharing where a social justice organization that I was considered giving to, I was looking at their website and they have a book club for their donors where every month one of their program staff or their CEO or whoever picks a book, everyone, oh, here's this month's book, read, 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 and come in at the end of the month or whatever, we're gonna have some cookies and coffee and talk about the book. That's it, no ask, but they're educating their constituents about what they do and bringing them into the organization closer to that stewardship, okay? What do y'all think? Am I missing the mark? Yes, the arts lend themselves to this kind of thing. It's true. You can because there's so many opportunities to bring people into your organization. What I'm saying is you can do it digitally and without an or it's it's out a little bit out of the normal scope of business, whereas in the arts it's it is the business, right? Every day there are rehearsals, every day there are performances, etc. So this does require a little bit above and beyond. But not as much as you might think, right? Here's another one. Pick up the phone. Back to our volunteers and board. If we're going to start a stewardship, if you're at the beginning of starting a stewardship program for your mid and lower level donors, which I think most people in this room are, have a big phone bank of stewardship calls. Ask all your ask volunteers or staff or board to come in and call your donors just to thank them for their support, past, current. Ask them why they're interested in the organization. Ask them how they feel about the benefits they receive, if they do. Um, you know, and, and just engage them. And the important thing to do is, well, of course, the important thing to do is have a script, to do a little bit of training, but also to be sure that there's a system for recording and responses, right? You don't want all this information to go off into the hinterland without taking advantage of it. Okay, what's that gonna tell us? What might we learn from these calls? Shout it out. Don't be shy. What their voice now sounds like. What their voice now sounds like. <laughs> that is very true. <laughs> uh, first of all, your donors are going to be thrilled. How many of y'all have received a phone call from an organization you may have been to? I have. Yeah. And I was just like, what? You're actually calling me? It was a board member, right? And it was a simple thank you, but it wasn't as much stewardship. It wasn't that well, thank you is stewardship, but they didn't, it wasn't voicemail. But if someone called me and wanted to talk to me about nonprofit X and I support, I would go on about why I'm connected to them, what especially about their work I'd like. I mean, I support animals, for example. Well, I have three rescues myself, and I love animals, and I want to see more work done when it comes to spaying and neutering so that we don't have these things. Right, so I'd be going on and on. Meanwhile, the development person's taking all these notes so that when they increase their spay and neuter program, who are they going to call? Right? So make sure there's some way to upload that information into whatever system you use, be it Excel, no, not note cards, I hope, but your CRM, whatever that is, right? This is not about an ask. And I, when I've done this in the past, I've 
often train people to say right up front, I am not calling you to ask you for anything but your input and feedback and thank you for your gift to our organization. Because, you know, you hear that voice when you call them, they're like, oh, God, you hear that they think you're going to ask them for money. So I said, we use right away if that's appropriate, right? And then, like I said, record the pertinent information in your database. When it comes to events, host stewardship events, and I'm going to tell you about one of the coolest ones I ever went to and why. I was involved with the Big Cancer Research Institution in town, you probably all know who it is, and I was wondering, as a fundraiser, I'd been in the arts, and I was like, yeah, we can take people to performances, we do all this stuff, what do you do with cancer research? Those folks actually figured out a way to put together a lab tour. It was the coolest thing ever. The research scientists were just doing their work, of course, they knew the dogs were coming, and they made it all so that, you know, there was no biohazards or anything like that. We've got to go and talk to the scientists and hear about their projects. The coolest thing ever that I never, as a professional fundraiser, would never have thought would have been possible. So you you just get a little creative. Um, but you get the opportunity to meet your donors face to face. Um, really, you know, learn again. You're educating them about the organization's work, learning what makes them tick, spay and neuter, lung cancer, whatever it ends up being, right? And those are our objectives. That kind of brings me to the end of my remarks, my prepared remarks. So we have about 10 minutes for questions or comments, both online, hi everybody, and here in the room, which is a pretty good turnout. So we'll start with you. Okay, I was waiting for you to I know your name, it's Shannon. Shannon. Shannon, Shannon, right. I met you in Everett, I think. It's been a couple of times. Yes. yes. Girls on the run. Yes, it's coming back. So this is a little bit in the weeds, but I'm like sitting here looking at our okay. donor data we, and we trying to figure out levels. And I like I'm just curious about how you and other folks define major donors. So let's say that you know we determine that's at the thousand dollar level mm -hmm. above. Do you look at a thousand dollar one time gift or do you look at their collective giving to say you know, like over the last five years, you've donated, so therefore you're a major. I put it into one year or one budget cycle. Um, so, and that's not to say that it has to be, there has to be a single gift of $1,000 in there somewhere. So say they, over a year, we've had two appeals and we had a auction and they, or a, a gala and they and a raise the paddle and they gave 500 and 500 and 500. Well, they're $1,500 donors. In my book, they're not $500 donors over one year's time. Okay, that's what I do. There's, I've seen it done different ways. Anyone else? What do you guys do in your organization? Yeah, to that, yeah. yeah. So based on who I'm giving for one year, but then I look at it going back three years because they might have had a couple of good years. There might have been staffing changeovers or whatever. Three years worth. I do. Yeah. Okay. And then beyond that, they're very last. Okay. And I would encourage you to think this through for your stewardship policy because as much as I hate to say it, there are certain donors who are in it because they want to go to the champagne reception at the end of the year. And they'll come and argue with you that the value of the time they spent holding envelopes, for, I, I am telling you from personal experience, should be counted and that makes them, a, and we're seeing some nods, and then they should get an invitation to that party. So you've got to be super explicit and say, you know, whatever it ends up being, cash donations totaling $1,000 over from January to December. I'm, I'm, I'm just telling you from my own grief to spare you some of your own. <laughs> and if you think I'd be really more scary, then so thank you. <laughs> what other questions? Online folks, anybody have anything? Not that anyone's indicated so far, but um, okay. we'll see. Is everybody ready to go out? What's your next step going to be? You're going to go away, you're going to probably have some lunch today, and then you go back to the office. And are you going to forget about everything we talked about, or what What step are you going to take next? I'm going to ask for social media handles on our donation forms. Excellent. Yeah. Social media handles on donation forms. It's <laughs> afternoon. Anyone going to do the segmenting? I know you, people start twitching a little because that involves you know data and numbers and crunching, but uh, yeah, I you know, like that idea about branding them in a certain way. Yeah, yeah. 
check out Canva. It's really very good, you know, and easy to use. And so follow-up question that my yes. that Russell with this yesterday. I ran a list of our donors. I was going to send some handwritten invitations to our upcoming soiree. Everybody who's donated in the last six months. And I have probably about 50. One dollar, five dollar, ten dollar. I'm just I'm curious, like, what do you do? Like, what sort of stewardship do you do as somebody who's like a first time donor and they donated one dollar? And I'll put it in the context of like, they probably like registered for our 5K mm -hmm. and they have an opportunity to add additional donation. Mm -hmm. Well, there's the on paper answer, there's the real answer, and the answer probably falls somewhere in between. The real answer, which is not attractive, is I would ignore them. But that is not okay. That is just, I'm telling you what really would happen with me in the past. The on paper answer is I would find my niece or nephew, somebody I could pay 10 bucks an hour to sit down and Google every single one of those people and research them. Because you never know their capacity, you never know their involvement in philanthropy, and you gotta find out if they are testing you because a lot of donors will give a small gift to test to see how you treat them to decide if they're gonna go on with their giving. That also might not be real. The answer is probably somewhere in between. Maybe look at their zip codes or Jen's gonna shoot me down no, for ignoring them. <laughs> and I'm not saying I would intentionally ignore them, that's something that would fall by the wayside. I, I guess I would ask also, like, um, because that happened a lot at SDRS, where I get five or ten dollar donations. But what I tried to do, and obviously, you know, we all have capacity issues, but to me, because I was building a program, stewardship was always one of the most important things for me because, you know, every person who comes and engages in the organization, I'm like, I need to grab you, hold on to you, and make you a friend forever. I would reach out to them and ask, hey, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering if you have a time that it's so it's always going to be a capacity issue, but you know, somebody made a five dollar donation. I would try to reach out to that person, thank them personally, and, and figure out why, you know, what compelled them to make that donation, and maybe see if there's another way to engage with the organization. Mm -hmm. Do they just do I have a volunteer opportunity for them to maybe come in and you know become closer? But but again, I know that your donor list is especially these you have to run. How many did you say, Chad? 50 or 60? The order oh, that, that I ran the list and it was like 191 of the donors. Like, okay. I had to make this decision about like right. postage and supplies and like staff right. time and intern time, mm -hmm. right? And it's like, okay, am I going to be able to send, send out 191 of these? So I chopped off like 50 of the one to ten dollar donors. And, that, and so, like, it was, of course, they got the acknowledgement from our database mm -hmm. thing, like, thanks for your donation. These are, you know, tax ID number. But I just haven't done any. Up. And actually, like, I'm not you, and then I have an our data. data. What's that, yeah, what about like an email that you can send out? But do a meal merge so that it has been named, you know, you know, thank them again, and maybe because the 50 people in the last week have called and, and asked why did you make this one? I'll jump in quickly because I have right. tagging on Jen. How about a survey? Right, to have something like that. You know, that. how was the was it a ride run, run for you? Why? Why did you decide to join us, and what would you like to see more of in the future? People who answer are the ones who want to engage with you. Right. Right. Yes. Yeah, just uh, I think in the uh, spirit of segmentation, like your first time donors through this event, it's kind of a segment, and you make them the capacity to call or email personally. All of them, but they can get this kind of like group uh, mail merged from the database or with their names, like. The first time, just did this event, like I see you, and it's kind of like it's still a full communication that's segmented specifically for them. So that's kind of like the middle ground. Is that what you do? Um, we could do that better. Uh, I mean, anyone who's first time on there, like they get the snail mail and people are like, welcome. Yeah, I gave you guys an intentionally bad answer because that's what we're trying to move away from. And I appreciate all of your ideas about time, money, and all. You got to kind of say, okay, we do not want to ignore these donors. That's not an option. So, what can we do that's fast, the fastest and cheapest that we can 
afford um, and still be in touch with them. I love what you said. I think that's the whole point of stewardship. I mean, there are bigger points, but just what you said, I see you. Like, that bottom line is what needs to be communicated, no matter, no matter how large or small the gift is. It's just so that they, the agency or the organization says, I see you. Thank you. Not Thank you. I see you. Your gift matters, even if it's a dollar. It's a dollar we didn't have yesterday, right? Yeah. <laughs> just to catch up, there wasn't. Uh, what worked well at a previous organization I was at, where we had a high volume of smaller dollar donations, we did a pretty uh, standardized new donor welcome series. So it was an addition to the thank you, it was an addition to the receipt, but then the month following their first time donation, they got a physical packet in the mail, and if you do it, all new donors from the last month are all first time donors, the cost will end up shaking up just fine, but there's still a little bit of a return. Um, and then we would do a follow up the second month with an email that had a survey. But well, you could do it any number of ways. We just do the email, but it was really yes. naming them as welcome to the family, welcome to the community. This is separate from the thank you, just the emails are free and automated just once a month. So it doesn't take up your whole life. Uh, but it worked really well for us. We would get a lot of responses, um, especially on the survey of what, what inspired your gift, how are you connected, how do you want to be dressed, is there anything you want, you want us to know? Um, and then those will be our indicators of folks to keep working. How long was the survey? Oh, it was short. It was like five or six questions. Yeah. And also, that's helpful, but also how long was the series? Is what it is. Like oh, it was months. just the two months. So it was just the, you know, month one in January, they get the first time gift, they get all the personal thank yous, yada, yada. Then month two, they get, for us, it was a physical packet in the mail that looked different than an envelope that had all kinds of cool information. Um, just more information about the organization, upcoming events, things like that. And then month three would be a follow-up email. Some of people might not have seen the printed mail or preferred email. And that would be a digital version of the survey that was also included. So you could do any number of things. There's just three months, and then we would try to do on the anniversary of that gift. So just pulling the list once once month of the annual. It worked because it was sort of fast to automate. You don't have to think about it as much. You can do a lot with a little. And there is a lot of information about new donors, taking good care of new donors out there. If you if you just Google stewarding new donors, you're going to get a few about packets, how to welcome them, how to try to bring them into the nonprofit family. Um, and those are all, you're doing a great job. Who is that previous organization you're not doing currently? <laughs> uh, well, we yeah, maybe that's your next step, right? But it worked well there. So yeah. Any other questions? Like, yikes, I've run out of time. Um, so, thank you for joining us. I have a bunch of resources that I put together every time I offer a workshop um, on strategies, how to segment, what lifetime value means. There's actual calculations for this kind of stuff. If you're leadership or numbers people, what the return is going to be and at what point. Um, and then just to let you know, my contact information is on here as well. I get paid to teach, help you raise money. So feel free to reach out if you want to bounce ideas off, if you have questions, da, da, da. Our next workshop is going to be about Giving Days, specifically targeted for Giving Tuesday in September with Megan Hall of the Seattle Symphony. She's going to be our guest. Megan's awesome and put together the whole new Give Big strategy. She really led that charge, and I'm thrilled she's going to speak with us. So September 10 at noon, mark your calendars. And thanks again for coming today.